Welcome, welcome. So we are here, we gathered. It's at the dark moon, dark moon in Scorpio, for those of you that are interested in astrology. And uh, the, we're heading into the dark time of the solar year too, three weeks to the solstice. So we're, we're taking a deep dive today into the depths and uh, the sea behind me is the North Sea. This was a photo that I took off of the, off the coast of Skye. I was on the southwest coast of the Isle of Skye, which is off of the west coast of Scotland. Um, the last time I was there, which I've lost track now since COVID has restricted my travels, but I think it was about two years ago. Usually I go once a year. That's where I'm from and where my family are. Uh, so I'm missing it right now. So I put this photo up to remind me. And also because the story we're going to be working with this evening is from this part of the world. So before I jump into that and talk about the, the story that we're going to be working with, I'm going to talk just a little bit about medicine stories in general. Um, so I know some of you have done this, these kind of events with us before, and probably have familiar with this, but I want to share with, with those of you who have not, um, that we offer these medicine stories as, as medicine, and, and they are different medicine for each of us. So it's not about, we will have time to discuss after, the, after I've told the story, we'll have lots of time to discuss it, both as a, the full group and also in, in smaller breakout rooms, um, to discuss what medicine the story carries for each of us, because it's going to be different. So it's not going to be an intellectual analysis of this story, it's going to be a heartfelt pondering, a heartfelt feeling into what is stirring in me when I hear this story. Welcome, Darlene. So I invite you, as you listen to this story, uh, to listen with your whole being. It's not just about listening with your ears and with your intellectual mind, which if, you're, if you've been raised in any way similar to the way I've been raised is very active. A lot of the time and is good at thinking things through and analyzing that's not what we're trying to do this evening i invite you to open up other parts of you other parts of your being and listen with your body listen with your the way you smell listen with the sense of feeling listen with your heart and so what is what is moving through you as the story just sort of floats around you um, and that you may find yourself entering the story at a certain point and wondering, where have I been for the last five minutes? You suddenly entered the story. And so pay attention to that. Pay attention to what, what was said, what image was evoked, what happened in the story when you entered. And you may notice that you exit the story at certain points and you go somewhere else. You go into your own story and that's totally okay. Um, and notice that. Notice what what triggered that what what exited you from the story and you may notice you get stuck at a certain point in the story you find yourself left on a rock and everybody else has moved on and that's okay too just notice that what has what has grasped your attention was it a smell was it an image was it a word was it a sound that that grasped your attention um and and just be willing to notice that it's not a good or bad thing it's just what it is um, and then when we discuss later uh, we'll be able to to think a little bit more about what that what that is meaning for you um so with that said does anybody have any questions before i jump in or any needs So the song, that, the story that I'm working with is called The Song of the Selkie. And uh, there are many, many stories of Selkies and I'll, I'll tell you what a Selkie is, but they come, these stories come from a particular part of the world. And you're looking at this behind me. This is off the West coast of Scotland. And these stories of seal women. So seals that are sometimes women, women that are sometimes seals, these beings that live between the land and the sea. And uh, the stories that of Selkies from up and down this particular stretch of the North Sea, though, so all the way along the west coast of Ireland, the west coast of Scotland, up into the Faroe Islands, which are a little bit east, no, west, west and north of Scotland, and then up into Iceland, there are stories from uh, of Selkies all over that whole region. So that's apparently where the Selkies live. They live in that stretch of very cold, often very grey water that that runs along. 
um, from Southern Ireland up to Iceland. And uh, there are many tales in, in all of those cultures, the, uh, the Gaelic, both the Scottish and the Irish um, cultures, the, the Faroes island cultures and, and the Iceland cultures uh, of these seal women. And so this is one of them. And this one, uh, this one came to me through Sharon Blackie, who some of you may know. Um, she's a, a Celtic studies uh, person and also a psychotherapist and wrote the book, If Women Rose Rooted, which I highly, highly recommend. And so this story is in her book. That's where I, I received it from. And I'm telling my own version of it, but the bones of it came from her. So somewhere, somewhere up on the north, north parts of Scotland, there is a coast, a coast that stretches for many miles a coast that sometimes is rocky, strewn with boulders covered in seaweed, and sometimes is sandy, covered in white, white beaches for miles. And somewhere up on this coast, and nobody really knows where, there's a cave. And some say that in that cave lives the old woman of the world. Although not everybody has seen her. In fact, we don't know that anyone has actually seen her or found the cave, but the stories say that that's where she lives. And you can tell that it's her because firstly, she lives in a cave. And secondly, when you go in that cave, you smell the most intoxicating aroma from her cauldron that's bubbling over the fire that she keeps tending. And in that cauldron, she is brewing a soup out of all the seeds in all the world and all the herbs in all the world and all the essences of all the living things bubbling away in her cauldron. And apparently she's also weaving. She's weaving a tapestry, constantly weaving the most beautiful tapestry in the world that's fringed with the quills of sea urchins. And she spins her own yarn and she weaves her tapestry and she boils her soup. If she's there. And somewhere further down, further south on that coast, there once was a young man who lived there. He lived in a fishing village and nobody remembers the name of the village, but it was there. And this particular young man didn't yet have a wife. All his friends had married and he still, he was still thinking about it. He was still searching. And there was lots of women in the village who wanted to marry him. They kind of mooned all over him. He was very handsome, he was tall, black hair, and blue eyes strong young man but he really wasn't interested in any of the girls in the village he found them kind of boring he wanted something different he wanted somebody new he wanted some mystery in his life and so he could often be found in the evenings around sunset and later just wandering up and down the beach looking as if he was looking for something something different on one evening it happened to be a full moon he was walking along this particular stretch of beach. And in the distance, on a large rounded rock, he saw something unusual that he'd never seen before. He saw 11 women who were slipping out of their skins and putting their skins on this rock and then dancing on the beach. And he'd heard the stories, he'd heard of Selkies, he'd heard of these seal women who could on the full moon only, they could slip off their skins and they could take on the form of a human. But he didn't really know that that was real, but he could see it, he could see it in the moonlight. He saw them dancing, he saw them humoring these new bodies, these different ways of being in the world. And he watched hid in a little crevice in the cliff and he watched and they danced and they danced and they frolicked in the sea and they giggled and they laughed and they swung each other around they were having a grand old time and then as the moon began to set in the west and just the very first glimmer of the grayness of the dawn started to poke its poke itself over the mountains in the east all of them all at once all 11 of them started to rush, started to walk towards the rock. And he had snuck up behind the rock. And while they weren't looking, while they were dancing, he had reached up on the rock 
and pulled down, and just tugged at one of the skins and he tugged it down and he folded it up and he put it inside his jacket pocket. So these seal women came back to their rock and they started pulling on their skins, pulling them from the feet up and wriggling into them, getting their flippers on and putting their skins on and one by one, turning back into seals, except for one. And she searched and she searched and she looked all over the rock and she looked in the sea and she was frantically looking and she couldn't find her skin. But the light was coming and the moon was going and they all knew that they had to return to the sea, otherwise they would be stranded. And she couldn't find it. And the other 10 sisters were bobbing in the sea by this time, their little eyes, their little black eyes, just looking up at her. They had, there was nothing they could do. And so they all went down below the surface and off they went and she was left there, wondering what on earth had happened. And then the fisherman appeared. And he said to her, don't be afraid, I have your skin. And she said, well, please give it me back. I, I need that to go home. That's the only way I can go home. And he said, well, I'll make you a deal. If you'll stay with me and be my wife for seven years, that's all I ask, just for seven years. Then at the end of that seven years, if you still want to return, I'll give you your skin back. And she looked at this man and saw the size of him and realized she had no choice. And so they went back to his home and very soon they were married. And within nine months, the silky woman gave birth to a daughter and she was delighted. And she named her daughter Mara after the sea. And they lived well enough. He made a good living fishing. And they had a beautiful little stone cottage just up on top of the cliffs. And she loved her daughter. She loved raising her. She loved playing with her. And they lived well enough. And as the, the years wore on, she really began to miss her home and miss her Selkie sisters. And she'd find herself on the full moons, wandering the beach. Her daughter was asleep, wandering that particular beach and looking for them, and she never saw them. And they must have abandoned that beach after what happened. And as the years wore on, she felt her longing to be home stronger and stronger. And she noticed that her energy here on the land was, was waning. Her hair was getting limp and her skin was becoming dry and dull. And, she didn't feel comfortable in this body, this human body. And she longed for the sea and she longed for her sisters. And she keep wandering, keep wandering on the beach to no avail. And she waited and waited for that day, the seven year mark where she would ask her husband for her skin back. And meanwhile, Mara grew and she was a sparkly young child and full of curiosity and questions and love for, love for life and love for the sea and love for the land. And the sulky woman enjoyed her, enjoyed mothering her. And she knew it was gonna be hard to return home and leave this little girl, but she knew that's what she had to do. She knew she had to go home to the, face, the place that she felt belonging, the place where she felt comfortable in her skin. So on their seventh anniversary, she said all of that to her husband. She said how much she had loved their life together and how much she loved him and, and Mara and their home and that she knew she must return, that something in her was dying, that some part of her soul wasn't being tended to by not being in the sea and not being with her sisters. And so she was wanting to have her skin back. And he laughed at her. He laughed and he said, no, I'm not going to give you your skin back. You're the most beautiful woman on this island. Why on earth would I let you go? And she wept. And she knew there was no convincing him. And as time wore on, he spent less and less time 
with her and Mara, he was out fishing more, or he was out down at the pub with his friends. And she was lonely and tired, so tired. She didn't have any energy. And Mara could see this emptiness growing in her eyes, in her mother's eyes, and was afraid of that emptiness and wanted to help. And so she said to her mother, let's look for this kid. Let's look for it. We'll find it. I bet we'll find it. And then you can just go home. And the sulky woman at this point had gone past despair. She didn't, she didn't even have the energy to go and look for her skin. So Mara took it upon herself. And she searched and searched for days. She searched the house. She went up in the attic. She went in the basement. She rifled through all the drawers when her father was out fishing to no avail. For days, she was exhausted. She searched and searched and searched. And she was so tired one night, she found herself in the boathouse where he kept all his fishing gear and she was searching in there and she was so tired. She crawled into the boat and was ready to take a nap and pulled his old fishing jacket over her to, to take a nap. And her fingers found the way into the, that little internal pocket in the jacket and, and she felt it and she smelt it. Something that smelt like the sea. She felt this furry skin. With a lot of excitement, she pulled it out. And as she pulled it out of his jacket pocket, it disintegrated. It was so dry, it just disintegrated into pieces. <gasps> oh, maybe there's a way to repair it, she thought. And she ran to get her mother and begged her to come and pulled her down to the boathouse. She was like, come on, come on, I think I found it. This is it. And she pulled her mother down to the boathouse. And as soon as her mother saw it, she fell to her knees and wept. She knew there was no saving that skin. It was gone. It was gone. It was so dry. There was no way she was going to be able to put that on. And that was the, she, that was the end. She thought that her life was over, that her soul, this is some part of her soul that belonged to the sea, would never be tended to, would never be nourished. So Mara took her down to the sea and kind of pushed her into the shallow water and just sort of let her body sit in the ocean for a little while. And it gave her enough strength to, to get back up and, and to walk back to the house. But she was pretty convinced there was nothing to do. Mara, on the other hand, was a bright young one. And she thought of, well, I'll go see the wise woman. So she took herself off to the edge of the village where the wise woman lived in a stone cottage surrounded by herbs. And she went up there one morning and she rapped on the door. She went into this wise woman's cottage and she explained the situation. And she said, oh my dear, I see how much you wanna help your mother, but your mother has to help herself. You cannot do it for her. And besides, I am not a woman of the sea. I don't know the ways of the sea. I know the ways of the land, and I know the ways of the plants and the animals here, but I don't know the ways of the sea. Amara felt her heart sink. And then the wise woman said, but there is one. There is one who knows, and she knows the ways of the sea. And it's the old woman of the world, and she lives in a cave, way north and west, as far north and west as you can go. And you'll know it's her because when you walk in her cave, there'll be a fire roaring and there'll be a pot over the fire that's making soup out of all the seeds in the world and all the herbs in the world and all the essences of all the living things in the world. And she'll be in there weaving, weaving the most beautiful tapestry you've ever seen, fringed with the quills of sea urchin. And so your mother must go there. And she proceeded to tell Mara what she needed to know. So Mara ran home and found her mother and told her this and told her that she must go. And the Selkie didn't have the energy in her. Her body was waning. She felt the energy, her life force just draining from her every day. But she looked at her daughter and she saw the hope in her eyes and she saw the love and she said, okay, I'll do it for you. And so she pulled on a pair of stoutest boots and she pulled on her warmest cloak. 
And that was all she took because the wise women had said to take, to not be burdened by anything that was not necessary. So that's what she took. And she headed north and she didn't know where she was going, but she followed the coastline north and it took her west and north and west and north. And she walked and walked for days. And if you've ever been on that part of the Scottish coast, you know that mostly it's raining. Often it's raining sideways and the spray's coming up from the sea. It's cold. That wind is blowing off the North Sea. It's cold. Oh, and she walked and she walked and she drank water out of the burns, ice cold water coming down from the hills. Sometimes she found some seaweed to, to eat, but it didn't really nourish her. And she didn't know where she was going. And she didn't really know if she was going to find this old woman of the world. And it didn't really matter at that point anyway, because what did she have to lose? So she kept walking. And one day the storm was raging stronger than it usually was. And it took a cloak and whipped it off and it flew off the cliff and out into the sea. And at that point she'd had enough. And she just fell down in the boggy, boggy, squishy grass and started weeping. And as she lay there with her ear on the ground, she thought she heard somebody singing. She wasn't quite sure because the wind was still howling. Maybe yes, somebody singing. And something that sounded like a spinning wheel that was being peddled by somebody very, very practiced in the art of spinning. Maybe. And she pulled herself up onto her knees and took in some deep breaths, and pulled herself up onto her feet and headed for the edge of the cliff. Carefully, carefully, because the wind was howling. And she descended the cliff, finding some footholds here and there, careful not to slip on the slimy stuff left by the seagulls. And she got about halfway down the cliff and there indeed, there was a, an opening. And so she tiptoed towards it. And before she stood in front of it, she pulled herself to be together the best that she could. And she put her chin up. She stepped out from the cliff and into the front of the cave. It took her eyes a moment to adjust, but there was a fire in there towards the back. And indeed, there was a cauldron bubbling over it, and she could smell something amazing. And there in front was a woman spinning. And she had next to her a loom and this most beautiful tapestry she'd ever seen, fringed with the quills of sea urchin. And the woman looked up from her work and looked at the selkie and said, So, you've come to find your skin. And it was all the Selkie could do to nod her head. And the old woman beckoned her in. She said, come, come sit by the fire. And so she walked in and she sat right down next to the fire. Oh, she let the warmth of it seep in through her body and into her tired bones. And she began to feel some of the, the life coming back to her. And the old woman of the world said to her, so your old skin is it's no good anymore, huh? And the Selkie nodded. And the old woman said, I've heard tales, I've heard some tales of Selkies who spent some time here on the land and then they put on their old skin and they go back home. They live happily ever after as if nothing ever happened, as if they never learned a thing. And that's all well and good for some people. But sometimes there's more to be done. There's more to be learned. With that, she stood up and went to the cauldron, dipped in a cup, filled a bowl and handed it to the Selkie. And as she breathed in the aroma of the soup, she couldn't help but start to the soup of all the seeds in the world and all the herbs and all the essences of all the live things in the world. And she drank it down. 
she began to feel her, her life force coming back, her body enlivening, her skin feeling moist again, her heart beating. She began to feel hope in her body. And by the time she'd finished that bowl of soup, she felt as good as the day her husband had taken her. And the old woman of the world told her what she had to do. And then once she was warm and she was ready, the old woman of the world gave her a cloak and said, off you go. And so off she went. And she walked out of that cave and down the cliffside and along the beach a little ways north. And there tied up, just as the old woman had said, was a wee curig, a little boat with oars in it. And she rowed herself a mile north and a mile west, just like she'd been told. And she came to a little island out in the sea. And she came, she pulled it up, pulled it up in a cove. And in the back of that cove, she could see a cave, just as the old woman had said. And so she walked slowly towards this cave, afraid of what she was going to find, but knowing she had to go in. And she went in to the dim, dimness of this cave. And as her eyes adjusted, she saw what she did not want to see. 11 skeletons, 11 seal skeletons laying there, their skins and to one side in a heap and all the flesh gone from them, just their skeletons. And she knew, she knew who it was. And she looked at the skins and she saw the markings on them and she knew it was her 11 sisters. And she fell to the ground and she wept, wept harder than she thought she was capable of weeping. And as the grief just washed over her, this home, these sisters, this family, gone, murdered, left, abandoned, disrespected. The old woman had told her a seal hunt, the men had hunted these seals, and as the storm picked up and left them in the cave to come back and get them later, had not come back, and their flesh had gone. And she fell to the ground, and as she wept, she remembered the song that the old woman had told her to sing. And so she sang. seal coming out of the water, an old one, one she didn't know. It must be a selkie, but it wasn't a full moon, so she had to stay as a seal. And she came up beside her, and they sang together. And they wept. All the grief in the world for these 11 ones, these dear ones, and for all those murdered, abandoned, disrespected. They cried. And they sang. And as they sang, the sulky opened her eyes and she began to see that the flesh was forming, reforming on these bones. That these bodies were starting to form, to come back. And as they sang and they wept, it seemed like their tears were bringing these bodies back, these glistening flesh and muscle started to grow on these old bones, all except for one, the smallest and the youngest, and stayed as bones. And her and the old seal kept singing and singing and their hearts were beating fast as they could see what was happening. And one by one, these seals got up and they slipped into their skins and they were alive. And they hugged 
And they greeted the, her, their long lost sister who hadn't, they hadn't seen for many, many years, all but one, the youngest and the smallest. And they greeted the old Selkie who'd come to sing. And as they realized that this youngest one wasn't gonna make it, that she was really gone, they circled around her and they sang and they sang this song of mourning, this song of grief to her. And the Selkie knew what she must do. And she picked up the skin of this young one, this new skin. And she knew that this was her way home. And it would have been so easy to slip it on and to go with her 11 sisters and this grandmother and head home. They would guide her home under the sea. It would have been so easy. But she knew there was more to do. And so she folded up that skin and she placed it inside her cloak. And she went out onto the shore and she kissed each of her sisters goodbye as they headed into the ocean and headed down. And then she got back in her boat and she rode a mile, she rode a mile east and then a mile south. And she tied the old woman's boat back up where she found it. And then she started walking. And she walked and she walked south and east and south and east. And she kept walking, but this time she had so much more energy. It didn't take her quite as many days until she got back to the village and she ran into the house and she found Mara. And she told her what had happened. And she said, Mara, I've got to go. I have to go to where, my, where I belong. I have to go to where my soul is nourished. And Mara knew that, she knew she had to go. And she was so happy to see her again. And so they went down to a certain part of the beach that had been a special place for them. And she sat with Mara and she told her as many stories as she could think, even the ones she told her a hundred times, stories of the sea, stories of her sisters. And she told her all the songs and she told her the rituals and she told her everything she could think of. And she told Mara one day, you will choose because you are half selkie and half human. And you will choose whether you wanna live on the land or you wanna live in the sea. But that day has not come yet. And for now I know I must go home. And so she took out this smaller seal skin, this new seal skin. It was fresh and new and didn't have the scars that her body had, the stretch marks and the bumps and the bruises. It was a new fresh skin and she, she wriggled into it. It was a little tight, but she got herself into it. This fresh skin under this old body. And with one more kiss for Mara, she slid off the bank and down into the sea. She popped her head up, her little black seal eyes, and gave Mara another look and then off she went. And Mara cried. And she went back home and her and her father mourned and they wept and they grieved and they missed her so much. And every full moon, Mara would go out and she'd walk the shore in that spot where she'd seen last seen her mother. She'd walk it and hope that she would come and she didn't. And then one night, a year after she had gone, a year after she'd left on the full moon, while Mara was down there walking, she saw her, she saw her little eyes pop up above the surface of the sea. And she watched as she slithered onto the shore and took off her skin. And there she was, her mother. And they cried and they laughed and they hugged and they kissed and they told stories of what had happened in the last year and how things were and how much Mara was growing. And, and then as the moon began to set and the sun began to rise, and Selkie put her skin back on and off she went to the place that nourished her and kept her alive. And every year on that anniversary on the full moon, she'd come to visit Mara. And she taught her that song. She taught her that song that had been taught to her as a song of mourning. But realized she had managed to transform it, transform it into a song of joy because that's what happens when you have the courage to make the long walk. And you have the courage to face the old woman in her cave. And you have the courage to do what she tells you. 
and you can transform your mourning into joy. And she reminded Mara that she would get to choose one day. And then off she went back into the sea. The end. So taking a deep breath. <laughs> and just notice what's moving in your body, what's moving in your heart. Where did you enter the story? Where did you leave the story? Maybe you're still in the story. What's alive for you right now? What can I leave? So in a little bit, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to, to break out into much smaller groups, maybe two or three people, so you have a chance to really share what's, what's moving. Um, but before we do that, I'd love to hear just from a few of you, what's alive, what's moving? Where are you in the story? Where did you come in? Where did you go out? What did you notice? You can just take yourselves off mute. And it doesn't even have to be a formed sentence or a logical thought. It may just be an image that captured you, maybe a word. I'm imagining being that child who decided that her best option was to help her mother leave her. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a courageous little one. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. Forrest says he's back on the beach in the cave of transformation. Yes, it's a good place to hang out. <laughs> what else is alive? The mother's sense that she didn't belong where she was, although she did love the people. She still didn't really ultimately belong there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jana. Yeah, that 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 yearning for home. Mm -hmm. That yearning to to feel rooted, to feel that you're part of it, to know that you're part of it. Yeah. There's so many images of uh, from the time the fishermen was so careless and self-focused and stole her mm. because of her beauty, mm. which signifies some things in itself, that in some aspects she was punished for being who she was. You know, she was pulled away from all that she knew and loved. On the other hand, it was mm, maybe an example you know of how life pulls you away from all that you know and love so that you can grow and of course you know that's what she did but yeah yeah yeah, yeah the way life initiates us into who we really are it often doesn't doesn't look the way we hoped it would <laughs> or anticipated it might yeah yeah exactly yeah Andra says feeling sad longing to be with my people yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's always that. Go ahead. Oh, there's just that sense of, I think of always somewhere inside of wanting to be a kid again, too, of being home and playful and free. And there's that that space that like you want like time to stand still, like when you were like maybe ten or something, you know, and and you believed in fairies and all that and lived with them and yeah. So it kind of the diving into the sea feels like that to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. After being in this adult world of responsibilities and um, yeah, being able to go back, back into that playfulness, that swimming in the, swimming in the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's multiple different ways to, 
to work with these stories and you're already by what you're saying you're you're doing that um but just to sort of give you a bit of a framework as you go out into to little small groups here that there's sort of I, I see it as three levels in which you can you can think about these stories um so one sort of the middle level is thinking about these stories as interactions between different characters all the different characters and who they might represent in your life or what they might represent in your life and how that that plays out you can also think of all those different characters as parts of yourself so them all part different parts of your psyche and how they relate to each other and who pulls who in what direction and how that works within your own psyche and we can also think of it on a cultural society level like how is this story playing out in our culture and what does it have to tell us about the way we organize our culture and so there's many ways to to think about it so i'm going to offer you the invitation to to break out into little groups i'll probably just do three some there might be a two there um so it's a nice small space for you to just think think speak about what what moved in you in this story how you see it playing out in your life um, what medicine is in there for you. And if you are terrified by that idea, <laughs> being suddenly thrown into a virtual room with a bunch of strangers, then you don't need to go at all. You can stay here and hang out with me. Um, but I invite you to go, go try it and you can always come back. Um, anyone got any questions before we disappear in that way? All right, so maybe we'll do like 15 minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning um, when we're gonna come back and then we can, we can all come back here and, and see what's moving. Let's see, I'm gonna fix this now. Okay, so you should get a little thing that'll pop up and invite you to join a room. Let me know if you have any technical problems. see a few people here if you're having technical problems just let me know if you're just opting out that's totally fine so i'd love to hear whatever little snippets or highlights that you would like to share um Please don't share anyone else's story that you heard. Just share for yourself what, what's moving in you, your thoughts, your feelings, what images are coming, memories are coming, what's moving for you. This is Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Hey. Hi, Kay. Hi. Um, so I was with Georgian Spruce. Very nice to speak with her. And um, what I made mention of was I, a long time ago, I made a sculpture. Um, it was just a sheet of pewter and I hammered a face of a seal and it was called the, the man who would be seal or the man slash woman who would be seal. Hmm. And so um, I felt very attached to this story and I was grateful that you were telling the story mm -hmm. and um, just the idea of those black eyes of the seal that are so uh, absorbing and then also reflecting to where you might be um, in your own life mm -hmm. so that's the only thing i want to say yeah thank you yeah and just to note there are also selkie stories of of men selkies it's not always yes women. 
Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Susan, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Yeah. So it came up in our discussion only from my perspective, I will talk, but it we kind of covered loosely sort of the idea of how much of your life is choice and how much is chosen, you know, sort of faded. And um, yeah, we don't have an answer. I don't have an answer, but the story poses that as well. Absolutely. Yes. And how, which of our initiations are voluntary and which are involuntary. Did I choose these lessons or were they, you know, yeah. They choose you. Well, yeah. Right. We have an opportunity to learn something from each of those adventures. Right. right. Yes. If you choose to. Or yes. you can, as the old woman said, you can just put your old skin back on and go back home as if nothing ever happened. Yes. And then it'll come back and knock on your door again sometime soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I, I'll share a little. Um, my partner and I both talked about uh, grief in, in relationship to the Selkie. And I have a, a story that I... Uh, Susan heard this last week. I shared it with a class that I was teaching online. Um, when my last husband died, um, I went through some really deep, long, hard grief and had really come through that grief and was in a workshop with an Irish medicine woman who took us through this journey. And the result of the journey was that I saw my late husband as a selkie <laughs> and uh, except he had a, a bear's face rather than a person's face yet I knew that it was him and and basically the the story was that he had to die he had to leave this physical plane because he had work to do someplace else mm -hmm. and and so this is the picture I painted mm -hmm. after the workshop and there he is as the bear who's actually a selkie <laughs> and and the uh the pink i don't know why it turned into pink colors as opposed to you know watery colors mm -hmm. but uh the other person who was in the uh, was in the small group with said you know that's that's the healing of the grief the pink mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, that is I'll beautiful. I'll take that bear with pink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. But I think that applies to the, to the actual Selkie story too, because she did have work to do someplace else. I mean, she needed to, to heal herself, to be who she truly was. And so there's grief in leaving her daughter behind, but there's joy in, in knowing who you are and following right. that, that path. Right. Yes. And I have certainly found that those, those two seem to come together, that they're just part of the same package, right? That whatever is, is joyful and full of love in your life has the seeds of grief in it and uh, that grief seems to also have the seeds of gratitude and joy somewhere you have to shuffle around in there but they're in there um so yeah everything we hold dear is eventually we're going to lose it and if we if we can't grieve for it then we can't fully love we can't fully fully feel the joy when we have it yeah Anyone find themselves get got stuck at a part of the story that like you just wanted to hang out there, linger there? Or found you exited before I ended and went off in some other story? I didn't get stuck in the story so much, but the things that it brought up for me are things I've been dealing with most of my life. 
and I feel like, am I not done with this yet? <laughs> it seems like it ought to be about time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those those lessons they keep coming. Yeah, um, until we until something shifts. But each time we go around, something something new. It's a spiral, yeah. not, not a circle, right? Each time we go around, there's some new lessons to be mm -hmm. learned. Yeah. Andra said, I got stuck feeling uprooted. Yes, yes, being taken from your home. We've, we've all experienced that on one level, and whether it's in this life or in our, our ancestors have been uprooted, and taken from our home. And often we're searching for that, that rootedness, that place of belonging. So that, that, that's one of the things the story brings up for me is, is finding home and being given that I live on another continent that I was born and raised and I, I love living here in the United States but I also love being back home and uh, there's always that grief always that grief every time I leave Scotland and I know that I'm not meant to be living there right now and so yeah that really I relate to that under that sense of uprootedness and then my work here over the last 21 years part of my work has been how do you grow roots how you grow roots in a new place that, that feel just as deep. I find that very interesting um, because I'm like the opposite of you. <laughs> I've grown up in the States and my heart longs for the Northern Isles, like <laughs> I'm ready to go home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's it. Someone else here. Yeah. Andre, my family's in Europe. Um, yeah, and that's, it's what I've realized as part of that, th those longings are, are messages to us from our souls, following those longings, even if we don't know where they're taking us, can reveal, reveal new things, reveal more information about who we are and, and why we're here. I lived several places um, during my life. I'd grown up in Arkansas and spent some time up in the mountains as well as just in the central part and uh, loved the mountains. And, um, and even though I, I liked in many ways the other places I lived and everything, it was it still didn't feel like home, you know, no matter how long I was there, even when there was family there and all. And then I had a friend um, who um, moved to Asheville and I came to visit her. And I knew very soon that this was my soul's home. Mm -hmm. It was just so clear. It was, I mean, I didn't have to even know much about it. I just, it was a feeling that was so clear to me. Mm -hmm. that this is where I belong. And I have felt more at home in this place than any place I've ever lived. Mm -hmm. Well, that's beautiful to hear. Yeah. yeah, and you trusting that intuition, trusting that heart feeling, rather than doing a, a left brain analysis of it, just trusting. Yeah, I'd done too much with the brain. <laughs> it's, <really long. laughs> yeah. it's a wonderful tool, and it's only one tool that we have. So yeah, that's beautiful to hear you trusting your heart and your intuition. Yeah, and that's what a lot of these, these shape-shifting stories, which are very common in the Celtic um, mythology of shifting animals to humans and various different forms of animals um, and a lot of them for me are about about that really, really trusting our instincts the animalness of us the wild side of us trusting that and not always conforming with the domesticated self the industrialized self the self that has a bunch of shoulds and should nots and rules and laws and things to follow not to say that those things don't have a place um, but we tend to overdo it in our culture. And so giving ourselves the time and space to, to feel into that, that animal part of ourselves, that, that instinctual self that wants to dive deep in the sea or fly high off the, off the mountains, whatever it is. Anything else stirring that wants to be shared? Well, the story had me reflecting on how I've learned something in the past year or two about bringing myself back to life, but wish mm. I could do it for others like the selfie woman did. Yeah. More to learn there. 
Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and that, that, that to me is a huge part of this story is the, the first wise woman, the one in the village said, Tamara, you can't just do this for your mother. She has to do it for herself. Like that we we each of us have to have to dig down deep and whether it's a, a four day walk to a cave or it's a four day fast out in a desert or whatever it is that we have to do um to, to find that part of ourselves find that part of ourselves that is ready for transformation that is that is going to bring that that we can't be looking to somebody else outside which is obviously where we all first go certainly where i first go is like oh what can i change outside of me can I change my job? Can I change where I live? Can I change my hair? Can I change the person I'm living with? <laughs> what can I change to make things feel better? Um, you know, which might have a temporary nice effect, but ultimately then you're left. You're still you, you're still with you. And so it's going in and finding that part of yourself that's ready to transform and is ready to do the work of that, that long walk or whatever it is that needs to happen to, to face the fear, face the thing you're afraid of, face the grief, face the pain, and to come out then with a new skin. So she had this, this new skin that was younger, and different, didn't quite fit, but it was, uh, it was a new version of her. And that's what was often at the, as you've been through a transformational process that you've got to step into a life that doesn't feel comfortable. It's not an old pair of shoes. It's something that's awkward and weird and you have to kind of figure out how you fit into it and how you be in it. Um, so that's what she was doing with that new skin. But that's the that's the nature of transformation. You can you can put back on your old skin, like the old woman of the world said, and and go on happily ever after as if nothing ever happened. Um, but what we know about that is that it's not happily ever after because at some point that lesson, that initiation is going to come knocking on your door in a different form, same thing, different form, until you're ready to to really embrace it. Thank you, Grace. Well, thank you all so much for joining me this evening and staying with me, hanging out. Um, I'm going to post this little, this little here um, in the chat here, which is to a, a, a program that I'm running next year. It's called the Seasons of Womanhood, and it's a nine month rites of passage program for women and this link will tell you a lot more about it but we're going to be working with archetypes 13 core archetypes of women um, both online to begin with and then through the summer we're going to do a, a ritual immersion where we get to actually ritually explore these different archetypes before moving in october to a prayer fast so an extended period of time um, out in the forest here in, in Western North Carolina, where we can really dig into these different archetypes that will just all be for women. And we get to work with each other, support each other in that and, and create a circle of sisters to, to explore deeper into what does it mean to be a woman and how do we shape shift like Selkies and what parts of our life are we stolen from and need to retrieve and lots of juicy stuff to work on. So I'll leave that and I'll put that in the link. I'm gonna send out an email in a couple of days with a recording of this for the people that weren't able to join us and I'll, I'll put that in there and I'm going to put in my email address as well it's just cat at rites of passage oh so if you want to if you have any questions or thoughts you want to contact me you can do that through that email any other questions thoughts anything that needs to be said before we wrap up yeah, you mentioned a book at the beginning of this that you had gotten the story from. Yes, it's called, I'm going to type it here, If Women Rose Rooted, and it's by Sharon Blackie. Sharon who? Sharon Blackie. Okay. Her name in the chat. Um, so she's a, she was a psychotherapist, and she's now a mythologist, and is deeply seeped in the Celtic world, has lived all up and down the west coast of both Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, I think. Um, so a lot of my Celtic understanding has come from her. Any other? Thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Beautiful. Well, I wish you all a lovely evening and a this descent into this dark moon phase over the next couple of days and a, and a beautiful solstice when it rolls around and uh, we've got a few more of these 
events planned over the winter, the story, live storytelling events. So look out for those. And uh, maybe I'll see you all around the fire at some point next year. Thank you all. Bye-bye.